Today we're going to review our work on subject verb agreement, so follow along with your note sheet. So subject verb agreement has a basic rule where the singular verb has to agree with the singular subject and a plural verb has to agree with a plural subject, which kind of seems kind of straightforward. So let's talk about what we mean. Sorry. So we have subjects um, that have been joined by like a conjunction and or 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 nor. Let's take a look at that rule. So when we use the word and, we're making something plural, which makes a lot of sense because and is like a plus sign. So you're kind of making something plural, so you should have a plural verb. That's pretty straightforward. If I said Mrs. Swore's gentle spirit in absence of sarcasm was or were strangely uncharacteristic this morning, so we called the nurse. But we would use the verb were. If we diagrammed it and we visualized seeing this in a diagram, we would see there's two subjects, spirit and absence. So even though the individual nouns are singular, we look at one noun plus a second noun makes two nouns, which makes it plural, so we'd use the word were. Now, or and nor are a little bit of like kind of a wild card because they can either be singular, they can also be plural. It's determined by whichever subject is closer to the verb, and that's different than with the word and. So even though visually, if we diagrammed it, it would look like there's two subjects, or and nor are basically um, disjunctive, meaning that they're not really joining something together, but they're kind of saying it's either one or the other. So if I said neither his wife nor his children knows or know about Mr. Heiser's secret stash of outdated Little Debbie snacks from Wegmans in his desk drawer, well, in this case, I would say no. And the reason I get to choose the word no as a plural verb is not because the subject is plural, is because I'm using nor to join the two subjects together, wife and children. And the subject which is closer is children. So children gets to define the verb. If I switch the order around, and if I said neither his children nor his wife, this time I'd say knows. I'd use a singular verb. Not because the subject is singular, but because the word which is closest, or the subject which is closest, or in this case closer to the verb, is wife. And wife is singular, so therefore I get to choose knows. Even though they're both the subjects, I go with whatever one is closer. Also be careful of hidden subjects, um, oftentimes in inverted sentences. So oftentimes the subject's in a position that's after the verb. And so in these inverted sentences, they oftentimes will begin with a prepositional phrase. Um, or they'll start with words like there or here. Here's an example. Here is or here are the tapioca pudding you requested, Grandma. Well, the word here or there is neither singular nor plural. It's not really has anything to do with the subject at all. Really what you're saying is the tapioca pudding you requested is or are here. And you'd naturally say the tapioca pudding is here because pudding is your subject. Once again, be careful of prepositional phrases, which also can create inverted sentences. If I sit on top of the jungle gym, sits or sit the ravens, ready to pounce on the unsuspecting school children, like a scene from Alfred Hitchcock's film, The Birds. Well, even though Jim is sitting right in front of the, of the verb, it's in a prepositional phrase, on top of the jungle gym. The actual subject's sitting way far away, and therefore I'm going to use the word sit, because I'm not saying the jungle gym sit, but what I'm really saying is the ravens sit ready to pounce. I'm saying the ravens sit on top of the jungle gym. So ravens is sort of what's controlling the verb in this sentence. Okay, ooh, ooh look at that. There's another type of raven. Ha. Next one. Um, subjects often travel with modifiers, which are like descriptive phrases, and they can kind of interrupt the flow of the sentence, and they can put a little deceptive distance between the subject and the verb. So we're not going to be deceived by that. So if I said a family of hippies was handing out or were handing out flowers to each passerby at market last Saturday. Well, I know you see the word hippies, and it's very tempting to choose that as your subject. But we know in diagramming, a subject can never be in a prep phrase. So I wouldn't say the hippies were handing out, because hippies is not my subject. What I'm saying is a family was handing out. Hippies is just there as sort of a temptation, and the SAT does that a lot. But really, the subject is the word family. A family was handing out. Oftentimes, what we'll have is a really long interrupting phrase. So if I say Mr. Marsh's class, as well as most of my other classes, bores or bore me to tears with the useless notes and rambling lectures. Well, if you think about it, the word classes is so close to that verb. But if you really think about it, the subject is the word class. 
So you'd say Mr. Marsh's class bores me to tears because that class is the subject. Even though there's a really long prepositional phrase is sort of a temptation as well as most of my other classes. And sometimes you're saying, well, isn't that what I'm talking about? Mr. Marsh's classes, Mr. Marsh's class rather, plus all my other classes. But the thing is, it's in a prep phrase. So the actual subject is still class. And if we were to diagram it, we'd see it as the class bores me. Not the classes, but the class bores me. Be careful of subjects that sound plural. So some vague words in the English language sound plural, but they're treated as singular. So we're going to come across this twice. We're going to come across it now as well as a little later in our pronoun unit. So words like someone, anyone, everyone, somebody, anybody, everybody, each and every, they're always going to be singular. So I would not normally say everybody are coming over to my house for the Super Bowl to cheer for the Eagles. I would say everybody is coming. And the reason that my grammar gut does that is because that's how we talk. And it's also correct that everybody is singular. Even though it sounds like there's a lot of people, everybody's treated as singular in the English language. Now, when I get to words like each and every, that's when we start second guessing ourselves. If I said each of my teachers, now it sounds like it's plural because you have more than one teacher. And it says each of my teachers have decided to bless me with busy work this weekend. But I would be wrong. I'd have to choose the word has because the word each is singular. No matter that there's a tempting sort of prep phrase which says of my teachers, the actual subject is the word each, and each is singular. So be careful of that. And lastly, and I don't have this on our note sheet, I'm not sure why, but lastly that measurements and amounts can also sound plural, but they're actually treated as being singular. So if I said three millimeters of solution A has or have been added to solution B, well, three milliliters sounds like it's plural, and I know it does. But in the English language, any measurement or any amount is always treated as singular. So you'd say three millimeters has been added to solution B. I don't know how to explain that one to you other than just simply saying that's just the rule that we have. And sometimes it's just how it has to be. All right, with that being said, practice those rules on your worksheet and then check your answer.